prayer. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Our gracious Lord, we come now at the beginning of this semester in the name of the Lord Jesus, asking for thy help, asking for thy presence with us as we open up the word of God together, as we come to this particular discipline of biblical studies, that we might have insight that will, those that are in the classroom now, those that are taking this uh, via distant learning, we commit, Lord, each student into thy hands. We pray for diligence, pray for understanding and comprehension, and we pray that through this whole course that we might come ultimately to a greater conformity. All right, well, we welcome you here, and I think there are four students that are taking this distance learning that uh, one way or another from time to time will be part uh, of our uh, discussions. Now, as we get started, let me just call your attention to the syllabus. If you can bring that up on your computers or wherever it is you have it, uh, let me just highlight a few things here. The very top of the page I give you, uh, but in this new office setting, I found that I must keep it closed uh, because I can't hear people coming down the hall and I'm engaged in study or thought and somebody comes into my office and begins speaking to me and scares me to death. So uh, I'll keep the door closed, just knock and uh, we can get business going. Uh, but do, I say, make, uh, make yourself feel free to come and talk to me at any time of the course. Biblical theology is a component of exegetical theology. All right, you're aware that theological studies are divided into four broad categories, and biblical theology is a segment of that division that we refer to as exegetical theology. It is not an end in itself, but it is rather an important and a help. Consequently, this course addresses in part several objectives of the THM program, and I've listed for you there uh, those objectives, those, and I've identified uh, here uh, these one, two, three, four, uh, five elements from the uh, catalog that this course, in one way or another, is specifically going to fulfill. We're going to find that uh, biblical theology, I say, is going to be a tool ultimately to systematic theology. They are not going to be enemies one of the other, but they are going to be handmaids one to the other. Uh, systematic theology becomes the grid, if you will, uh, the framework into which we put all the puzzle pieces uh, of the word. And biblical theology becomes a means whereby we identify what those particular pieces are. Uh, and systematic, I say, shows us ultimately where those pieces fit. So they are complementary disciplines. Description of the course. This course is a reinforcement and development of the application of the principles of biblical theology, particularly focusing on Scripture as the interpretation of redemption, with a view to demonstrating how the discipline contributes to and demonstrates the validity of covenant theology. Now, that's our creed. Uh, that's our confessional position. And while covenant theology is a system of theology, it does influence how we understand and apply biblical theology in contrast to dispensationalism, let's say, uh, which is a system of theological thinking that's going to affect and influence how they uh, implement uh, the whole course of biblical theology. Much will be the same as far as the parts are concerned, but how we put those things together uh, are going to be uh, determined by our overall theological grid, which for us is that covenant theology. Attention will be given to how biblical theology aids in identifying the specific themes and messages of individual books of the Bible and how they relate to the holistic understanding of the Scripture. How do we put the Bible together? We affirm our creeds, we have our systematic theologies, uh, but let's face it, the Bible was not written that way. All right? We don't go to one book of the Bible to find in one place everything that we need to learn about sin. We don't find in one place of the Bible everything that we need to learn about 
the nature of man or uh, the doctrine of Christ or salvation. Uh, those are uh, themes of systematic theology. We have all of our loci in systematic theology that deals with those particular issues. Uh, but obviously the scripture was not written. There's not one book of the Bible that I go to that this is the sin book or this is the righteousness book or this is the Christology book. No, the Bible is uh, the database from which we gather all of the information to form that systematic theology. But biblical theology is going to be the means whereby we see the holistic approach, uh, the holistic message uh, of the scripture and how all of those parts uh, are used for our ultimate uh, objective of understanding and proclaiming uh, the scripture. So uh, how does it fit together? Uh, there's no one place I say uh, where we can come to a book of the Bible and say that everything that I need to know about uh, doctrine X is going to be in this book. Nor will I conclude that because book X doesn't say this about this doctrine or that doctrine, uh, that that author was ignorant or disagreed or didn't understand that doctrine. Now what was the purpose of the books? What were the themes of the books? Uh, and that I say is discerned through this biblical theological method. Now the nature and methods of biblical theology are the same for and applicable to both Old and New Testaments. Primary attention on this course will be given to the Old Testament for illustration and application of the discipline. That's because that's my field, all right? But I want to make it clear that the discipline and the uh, procedures that we use for biblical theology is the same for both Testaments. Now, I will be flexible here. I will be flexible here, and if some of you uh, do have a desire to, when we come to the word studies, to do a Greek word instead of one of the Hebrew words that I'm suggesting, talk to me and uh, you'll find that I am reasonable and will uh, let you go in a New Testament direction uh, so long as it is going to be a word that is theologically uh, charged as those are. So talk to me, all right, talk to me if you have any uh, suggestions there, and I will certainly work with you. The same will come for the book studies. Uh, but again, my point in this class is ultimately going to be focusing upon the methodologies uh, of biblical theology that you can then implement uh, in both testaments. It's the same, it's the same discipline. All right, the objectives of the course. The ultimate objective of the course is to provide students the foundation for using biblical theology as a tool in the exegetical process. In order to accomplish this objective, the course will provide students examples of data collected by using uh, the method as well as opportunities for the students to be engaged in the process. Now, one of the things that I envision here, uh, at this level of class, you don't need to have me sit here or stand here uh, and just spout out uh, information. I will take time in class to uh, deal with the methodology for each of the approaches of biblical theology. I will illustrate uh, how that and what that looks like uh, in various instances, but you'll be working on individual uh, projects and every student will be doing different uh, words, different topics, different book theologies. Uh, and I want you to be able to share those. All right, I want to be able to share those, and so when those projects are due, we'll take some time in class for each of you to uh, present uh, at least a summation of what you uh, have done. And those that are online, I've talked to the administrator here of the uh, IT stuff, and I've been assured that we can do something to uh, bring you into uh, the arena as well when we come time for those uh, in-class discussions. So uh, the two things, I will explain uh, the methodologies, we'll talk about it. Uh, I will illustrate it with a couple of examples perhaps and then you'll do the projects and we'll discuss those uh, together. And since PRTS desires to train students for ministry, the ultimate goal then is to gain a tool that can be used over and again in Bible study and in sermon preparation. 
This goal is appropriate even for those pursuing a teaching ministry since teachers must teach by experience as well as theory. So by the end of the class, uh, I trust that these six objectives will be met to articulate the function of biblical theology as an exegetical discipline, identify some of the key theological words and how their meaning contributes to the theological propositions of scripture, be able to ascertain the principal theological messages of individual books, articulate those in a logical, analytical fashion, be able to trace and develop key theological themes throughout the scripture or within particular portions or books, become familiar with some of the standard works and then gain a tool, I say, that will provide a lifelong personal edification in the study of scripture, as well as providing a database for preaching and teaching material. All right, now, the reading material, there's one required book, just the little book by Clink and Lockett on understanding biblical theology. Uh, this is simply a synopsis, all right, of the different approaches uh, that have been uh, used and postulated uh, for biblical theology. I don't, uh, I don't agree and I don't like some of his assessment and some of his descriptions, but uh, overall it will at least give you the idea uh, and introduce you to the different approaches uh, that are taking place under the rubric of biblical theology. So I ask, please, that you read that uh, textbook. I'm not going to test you over it, I'm not going to quiz you over it, but I want you to read it and be familiar uh, with uh, his uh, assessment and some of that we will uh, discuss in class. And I think you'll find very quickly which of those uh, I fall into. Uh, as we make our way through. Uh, then in addition, read a total, in addition to that, you read a total of a thousand pages from at least five of the following and write a one page synopsis for each source read. And I've given to you, some are old, some are new, some are dealing with uh, more the nature. So of those sources, now I want you to get a sampling here. I don't want you to, some of these books are long. You could read just one book and get a thousand pages perhaps. Uh, get a sample, all right? Do a synopsis uh, of the book, and all I'm asking for, not a, not a detailed review uh, or an evaluation, but just a one-page synopsis of the approach that that book takes, what contribution it is making uh, as far as this discipline is concerned. And uh, for all the ones that you have read, you keep a track of the number of pages, please. Keep a track of the number of pages you have read, and those uh, one-page uh, synopses will be due at the end of the term. Yes, sir. Would you like the synopsis of Clint and Lockett? No. No, you don't have to. Uh, I say that's really just a, a, a summary for you of, to give you the idea that when we talk about biblical theology, What are we talking about, all right? And not everybody defines it the same way. Not everyone implements it the same way. So I want you to be aware that there are different, uh, different approaches out there, and that book will give you a, a general synopsis of that. But no, I'm not asking for a synopsis there. All right, now some topics for discussion. Uh, the introductory material, I'll touch on some of those, not all of them, but some of them uh, we'll discuss. Then the key words for Old Testament theology, and again I say if you will uh, prefer, uh, if you want to do a, a Greek word, uh, the methodology is going to be the same. I'm going to be discussing methodology with you here. Uh, talk to me, you know, if I think it's a uh, legitimately, uh, theologically uh, important word, uh, then I have no objection to your uh, dealing with that. Now, I've selected what, 33 words here. Uh, these are words that have theological, what can I say, they're theologically charged, all right? They are theologically charged. Uh, and if we can know what some of these theologically charged words are, uh, it's amazing how that will aid in your immediate interpretation often uh, of the scripture. 
I don't know how many times in, in my ministry uh, I, I, I've been in church and someone, someone comes to me uh, with a Bible open, right? They come to me with their Bible open and they say, what, what, what does this verse mean? All right, I, I've been reading this. I don't understand it. What does this verse mean? And I don't know how many times uh, just looking at the verse and I see one of these words and as soon as I see that word, okay, there's the significance. It helps to uh, be able to get in your mind how a particular Hebrew word or how a particular uh, Greek word is typically translated in King James uh, version is what we're using. Uh, and I see that, okay, here's the word and we can immediately uh, give some help. So knowing some of these key words that occur over and again uh, in theological context will help a great deal. So I want you to select from that list. Now a couple, of, I, but you check with me because a couple of these I'm going to do for you. All right, and I'm not going to let you do the ones that I'm doing. Uh, otherwise your paper would be really good, right? That would be the case. Uh, so check with me. Uh, some of you have already talked to me. It's time to slip in a bit early here in terms of uh, making selections. You better remind me because when you ask me, uh, I may have in the moment of weakness said that's fine, but I have forgotten, all right? I have forgotten. Uh, so if you have already talked to me and made some selections, let me know that I've already, before we go on. Yes, sir? I'm gonna do one for each person. You're gonna, everybody's gonna do two. Two, two words. Two words. All right, you may select it from this list, or I say if you are so bent on doing a Greek word, a New Testament word, identify that, talk to me first to see whether it's going to be of sufficient uh, data to do a study on, but that would be fine. So I'm not limited, but everybody's gonna do two words. All right, everybody will select two words and you'll write a word study for me and that's going to be detailed for you. Uh, the first one coming due on September 16th, second on September 30. And just a couple pages, all right, just a couple pages. Everything I need to know, and you'll see this as we go through, uh, about a word as far, I can pretty much give you in two pages, all right? Uh, if I have a word study that's 30 some pages, most of it I don't want to read, all right? It's not relevant to the issue. So we're going to be talking about biblical semantics. One of the lectures I'm going to give you are biblical semantics and how biblical semantics relate to uh, biblical theology and how we understand the meaning of it. How do I know what a word means? You see, How do I know what a word means? How can I know what a word means? Uh, what do I look for? That's what I want us to train ourselves to do here. And I'll set up the paragraphs. I'll basically tell you what I want in each paragraph but that'll come in a minute or two, okay? All right, so those, uh, same thing for the units on old T books. If there's a New Testament book you wanna do instead of one of those, then you talk to me and uh, we'll make arrangements. Uh, subject studies, you have a paper due on that, an outline. And again, I think some of those could work either way for Old or New Testament, yes. I'm sorry? I'm just kind of skipping through. You're going to do a book, all right? The, the book theology will be the major paper that you do. From this list, unless you can convince me otherwise, okay? If there's a book that you would really like to do that's not on this list, it's a New Testament book, talk to me. If it's another Old Testament book, talk to me. That could be possible. I'm flexible, all right? You're gonna find that I'm flexible and that I've got a heart. I care for you, all right? And your happiness, your happiness is right there at the top of the list of stuff I want, right? All right, but yeah, so there'll be actually how many projects then? There'll be one, two, three, four, projects in addition to the reading uh, synopsis. Two word studies, a subject study, and the book theology. And the book theology will be at least 20 pages. That will be your major project, 
All right, that'll be the major project for the course. But we'll come to that, I say, and how to approach that in due course. Okay. All right, any questions on, on, on the syllabus? Are they happy? Yep. Just to permit a quick edit, um, the word study is three, and then the book study is one, and then subject study is, is one. one. And you say the book study is the main paper. That'll be your main paper. All right, at the point value I've given, and the point value is relative, right? But I'm giving, I think, 50 points for, uh, for each of the word studies. 75 points for the uh, subject study, and 150 points for the book theology. If you think that's not enough points, we can do this, all right? <laughs> I can say 100 points for each word study, 175 points then for, <laughs> it's all relative, right? It's all relative. The major weight is going to be on the book theology. But if you're, if you're one of those point grubs, right? We know what students are, students are point grubs. So if you want more points, I can, I can give you more points. Let's, 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 you, you, we can make the book theology worth 5,000 points. All right? It's all relative. Okay? Any other questions? All right, very good. Now what I want to do today then is just to begin talking with you about what Old Testament or what biblical theology is. What is biblical theology? And in discussing this question, all right, in discussing this question, we're going to be looking at it from two, two perspectives. I want to look at it from the aspect of the nature and then also the methods. All right, what can we say about the nature of biblical theology and the method? And when we speak of the nature, here we are for the most part, making comparisons between biblical theology and systematic theology. All right, how does biblical theology and systematic theology differ as far as nature is concerned? Now there are going to be some that would argue that the only difference between the two concerns the methodology. There are different methods, all right? There are different methods. But is there a significant difference in the nature of the two disciplines? So let me establish some background here and then we'll see if we can draw some conclusions. Now there is a name uh, that you need to be aware of uh, in regard to uh, the history of the discipline, J.P. Gabler. You know that name? J.P. Gabler. Gabler gave a lecture, all right, and this is a famous lecture that we connect with this particular discipline of biblical theology. Gave this lecture in 1787 in the University of Altdorf called Concerning the Correct Distinction, Concerning the Correct Distinction Between Biblical and Dogmatic Theology. What he's calling dogmatic theology is what we call systematic theology. Okay, so he gave this lecture, and this lecture resulted in his being designated as the father of biblical theology, called the father of this new discipline. Now, I'm going to read a paragraph. I want you to listen carefully uh, to this paragraph from this lecture, and then we'll analyze it. Gaber says this, biblical theology is historical in character and sets forth what the sacred writers thought about divine matters. Dogmatic theology, on the contrary, is didactic in character and teaches what a particular theologian philosophically and nationally or rationally rather decides about divine matters in accordance with his character, time, age, place, sect, or school, and other similar influences. Now that paragraph is most significant in terms of how Gabler is identifying something different 
about the nature of this discipline that he's calling biblical theology and what we know as systematic theology, all right? Some contrast, let's make this contrast. So here's systematic and here's biblical theology. On the one hand, he's saying systematic dogmatic theology deals with complex ideas, whereas biblical theology deals with simple ideas. He says that systematic theology is the biblical theology, if you will, plus philosophy. All right, biblical theology plus philosophy, whereas biblical theology is just the religion of the Bible. Can you read my writing? Simple, the religion of the Bible. Systematic theology, he says, is didactic, teaching, it's for teaching, and biblical theology is historical. All right, so think we can identify or delineate those points of contrast between systematic and biblical theology per Gabler's assessment. Complex versus simple, biblical theology plus philosophy versus the religion of the Bible, that which is didactic versus historic. Now, as you read that, I hope, I hope there were some statements immediately that you caught that bothered you, right? Anything bother you in that statement? Let me read it again. And, and I want you just to flip your hand up for me as soon as I read something that bothers you. Biblical theology is historic in character and sets forth what the sacred writers thought about divine matters. At that point, your hand ought to be waving, all right? Your hand ought to be waving. He, on the basis of that statement, is denying what? Revelation. He's denying inspiration. He's denying revelation that what we have in the Bible is simply a record of what these sacred writers thought, what they thought about divine matters. And our presupposition, our presupposition is that the Word of God, the Bible, is what God, it's God's mind, is what God has thought, if you will, and what God has revealed and via his Holy Spirit inspired these holy men of old to write. We take exception to that particular statement. Dogmatic theology, on the other hand, is didactic in character. It teaches what a particular theologian rationally decides about divine matters in accordance with character, time, age, place, and so forth. There's a sense in which that is true, all right? There is a sense in which as we systematize the scripture, we are going to, uh, we are going to make deductions. We'll talk about that here in just a moment. But the principal, the principal significance and the principal uh, problem with Gabler's notion here of biblical theology is it is simply a record of the religion of the Bible, all right? Might as well study Gilgamesh Epic. Might as well study Atrahasis. Might as well study, it's in the same category. It is just what those particular ancient people, what they thought about divine matters. Now, it's interesting and we'll, I, I, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on the history of the movement, but it's not without significance then that this discipline, biblical theology, that is very dear to me, all right? I love biblical theology. And I think it's a wonderful discipline and tool that we can use. And we implement that in our exegesis classes and we've taught that here, you see. But it had its birth. Biblical theology as a discipline had its birth in rationalism, all right? In a rationalism that denied the supernatural origination uh, of the scripture. Now, 
Flowing from this was a three-stage technique of study. Gaylor emphasized then the interpretation of passages by grammatical historical exegesis. Are we opposed to that? Are we opposed to grammatical historical exegesis? Of course not. Of course not. Uh, a comparison of passages by noting agreement, disagreements, discrepancies? Are, are, are we opposed to the analogy of Scripture? Of course not. Of course not. Uh, to formulate those ideas without distorting the material? I don't want to distort the material. So there were implications of that that are all right, they're good. But it's based upon an assumption, a presupposition that the source book that the source book was anything other, something other, than the Word of God. So from a liberal perspective, and Gaber was a rationalist, he was a rationalist, uh, influenced by various evolutionary ideas and whatever else, uh, we have the birth of this discipline that has elements and components that are most legitimate and can be most helpful ultimately in the study of the Scripture. Now from a conservative standpoint, from a conservative standpoint, can we see is there a difference in nature between biblical theology and systematic theology? One of the books that I have listed for you to take a look at uh, is by J. Barton Payne. Uh, Theology of the Older Testament. Even his title suggests something there, not the old, but the, just the Older Testament. But J. Barton Payne was Reformed, Covenant. Uh, his last teaching assignment was uh, at Covenant Seminary back in the 70s uh, when he finally uh, passed away. Uh, so a conservative, all right? Payne was conservative, he was evangelical, he was covenant. And in discussing the nature of biblical theology in comparison with systematic theology, he puts it in terms of two questions, and I think these are very, very helpful. He says that biblical theology seeks to answer the question, what has God said? All right, biblical theology answers the question, what has God said? Systematic theology answers the question, what is true about God? What is true about God? And in answering that question, in answering that question, right, we sometimes have to make deduction. We have to draw conclusions that are not wrong, that are not illegitimate, but we have to draw conclusions. Uh, those of you that know the uh, statement in the Westminster Standards concerning the Scripture has this little paragraph, this statement, that all things necessary, speaking of the Scripture here, that all things necessary for His own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life, is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. Biblical theology, systematic requiring sometimes the deductions. You remember, you remember when Christ, one of His controversies, contest with the Sadducees, resurrection, right? Sadducees denied the resurrection. And uh, Christ is dealing with them, and he excoriates them for their ignorance, right? You're ignorant. Don't you know the scriptures? Right? And his great text, the great text that Christ used to prove to the Sadducees, to argue to the, for the Sadducees, the resurrection was what text? Remember? I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right, that's the text. 
I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now that's the statement, if you will, of biblical theology. That's what God said. That's what God said. But Christ excoriated them for not making the proper deduction, right? Now your statement. The deduction from that, I'm not the God, he's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living, you see. Now, I can exercise, all right? I can exercise every ounce of my considerable exegetical skills on that text in the Old Testament and not extract from that the statement of resurrection, you see. But Christ wants us to think, all right? If this is true, if this is true, if he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then think this through, he's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. So a deduction. So we have warrant in the scripture itself by the Lord Jesus to make the theological deductions or draw those conclusions on the basis of what are said. So both are necessary, both are legitimate questions. What has God said? All right, that's the data of Scripture. That's the data of Scripture. How do we interpret, how do we come to understand what it is God has said? And then now, in systematic theology, bringing that full circle to the truth that is declared and inferred. So why creeds and confessions are so necessary for teaching. And I, I think Gabler, Gabler was right from the standpoint that he said systematic is didactic. I mean, our creeds and our confessions are suited for teaching, right? Our catechisms, our catechisms, our confessions of faith, how well they are suited for teaching. And to preserve, to preserve the truth. You know, we, we, we have some today that don't seem to like creeds and confessions, and they argue, I have no, I have no creed but Christ, right? You've heard that. I've got no creed but Christ. And it's generally those that make that affirmation, that declaration, I have no creed but Christ, are the first ones to go into heresy. They're the first ones to go into heresy. Because there's no wall of protection, you see, to identify what it is the Scripture uh, is teaching. So biblical theology, systematic theology handles the same data, but it asks different questions. Now in this regard, you know, I, I think we need to be careful and, and, and admit this, right, there, that there is, a, uh, there, there is a progression of, of development. Let's, let's start here. Here's the Bible. Every Bible believer, every Christian is going to say, I believe the Bible's true. I believe the Bible. I believe that everything in the Bible is true, yeah, from cover to cover. Yeah, we believe that. I believe the Bible is true. And I would dare say that every genuine believer can make that affirmation. Now, the next question is what? I believe the Bible is true, but what's the next question? What does the Bible say? All right, and so we have our interpretation. We have our interpretation of what the Bible says. And while every Christian will affirm his belief in the Bible, not every Christian is going to have the same interpretation of what the Bible says. Now, I believe, and, I, and I'm not, I, I don't mean to sound arrogant here, but I believe that every one of my interpretations of Scripture is right. See, I do. And you do too, and you do too. I would be a rare fool. I would be a rare fool if I said, you know, I'm right so often, I'm right so many times, 
I think on this particular verse, I'll interpret it wrong just to show my humanity. No. I believe, and you believe, that every one of your interpretations is right. But what happens? What happens then, while you affirm the Bible is true, and I affirm the Bible is true, we have different interpretations. What do I think of you? I think you are wrong. And what do you think of me? You think I'm wrong. You, say, you think I'm wrong. We have to caution, and I have to be honest here, that while I believe that every one of my interpretations are right, my interpretations do not have the same authority as the Bible. That's why even in Reformed circles, when we talk about the Westminster Confession, we often refer to it as what? The substandards, right? The substandards. The Word of God is the standard. Here's our confession of faith, substandards, interpretation. But I believe it's right. I have to be careful. I have to be careful here that I look at someone who says, you know, I don't, I don't interpret the Bible that way. If we're not careful, we're going to say what? If you don't hold to my interpretation, you don't believe the Bible. call that theological drift. Theological drift, where we drift away from what the Bible says and put ultimate authority somewhere else. Now, I have the conviction, and here's the next day, right? I have the conviction, we've already talked about this really, I have the conviction that my interpretation is right. And that conviction then translates into my ethics, how I behave. So from the Bible to interpretation to conviction to ethics. But I see so often happening in Christianity, in Christianity, in various segments of Christianity, this theological drift. I think sometimes in a confessional environment, you know, we, we stop here. If you don't hold my interpretation, you don't believe the Bible. There are certain segments of Christianity that if you don't practice it the way I do, if you don't look like I do, if you don't do what I do, hey, you went to, you did, you must not believe the Bible. You see? Now, I want everything that I do. I want my practice, I want my ethics to trace back to the Bible. All right? I want to live biblically on the basis of my conviction, on the basis of my interpretation, on the basis of what the Bible says. But I say we want to be careful of this, what I'll call the theological drift. Now, biblical theology, here's where biblical theology comes in. Huh? Biblical theology and the exercise of biblical theology is going to become, in many ways, the safeguard to my interpretation and my systematic. Right? And then my systematic, I say, defines the sphere, the grid in which we are going to ultimately understand the Bible. So there's a circular, there's a interrelationship here that we must maintain. Okay, you with me here? So two questions. So I, I like Payne's question. I, I think he's getting to the essence of it. Biblical theology, what has God revealed? What has God said? Thus saith the Lord. All right, thus saith the Lord. And let's use our exegetical skills, let's use our language skills, let's use, our, let's use whatever skill we can muster to identify what it is that God says. And then what is true about God? How does this fit and how does this contribute then? What are the deductions uh, that I must make to understand and to comprehend the fullness of the truth that God has given to us? So the two disciplines, the two disciplines here are going to be uh, complementary, uh, one with the other. Uh, Gabler referred to this as the philosophies. I refer to it as the logical deductions from the scripture uh, that uh, is mandated. And Christ, I say, gives us the warrant 
uh, for using the scripture uh, indeed in that fashion, expecting us to do so. We err concerning the scripture. If I don't figure out from that statement, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he's the God of the living and of the dead, and therefore, conclusion, resurrection, you see. Uh, that is the line of thought that the Lord Jesus himself warns for us uh, to put into practice. All right, that's the nature then. Any questions? Yeah, and I, I'm not sure that I can, can, can put that, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in an order. Uh, I, I admit that I have a grid, okay? I compare it, here, here's the analogy that I use. My, my wife likes to work on puzzles, all right? She works on puzzles, and she's always got a table up with some kind of a puzzle going on. And I accuse her, right? I accuse her of cheating, right? Because as she works on this puzzle, she has the, the lid of the box right there, all right? She's got the lid of the box right there. And there's the picture. That's what she knows what it's to look like before she puts it together. You see? And got all that stuff. And so she starts matching colors and she puts all the colors together and she. I says, you're cheating. I said, if you really like working in puzzles, puzzles, you throw the box away and turn all the pieces upside down, all right? You turn all the pieces upside down, and then you work on it. Uh, I don't have the patience for it, nor the interest in it, or the mindset. I do get mean sometimes, and I'll hide a piece, right? <laughs> <laughs> hide a piece someplace. But that's, and I face the consequences because of that, too, but that's, uh, whatever. But you know, then I start to think of that. And then what does she do? She, she finds all the pieces that are, have, has a, a straight line on them. And the first thing she does in every puzzle is put the border. She puts the border on. Now then she's got the border. She's got the border and she still have all these independent pieces. Where do they go? Where do they go? Well, she may not know where they go precisely. She may not know where they go precisely but she knows it goes someplace in here and not out here, you see. And finally it dawned on me, you know, I, I watched her, I said, that's a great example. It's a great example of the relationship here between systematic and biblical theology. There's my grid, or right? systematic theology is my grid. Where do I learn that? You know, I, I can't say that I get it, where does it come from? But there's my grid, right? Biblical, I've got all these pieces now. Okay, that's how that fits. It goes here and it all, it all works together. Uh, so I'm not saying, I, I don't think I'm suggesting here that biblical theology is first and then systematic. I'm saying one's a safeguard to the other, the other is a safeguard and defines the parameters of the other. Uh, oh, without question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe pick yeah. two other ones. But. Yeah. Uh, it, it, that, that's certainly true. You know, that's certainly true. But even there, I think if you, if you look closely, there's going to be more relationships. You know, those, those are not going to be completely antagonistic one with the other. And a lot of it becomes simply the terminology that I want to, uh, that I want to use. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I know when I come to do the individual exegesis, and, and historically, I don't know, you know what comes first. You know, we have covenant theology come in, Colchaeus, you know, yeah. but it evolves, evolves right? There's, there's an evolution here of, 
uh, of, of the thought. We have the historic creeds, and it defines, it begins to define the parameters, and it's almost like, you know, as we go through those ancient creeds, and then we come to the Reformation creeds, we're just adding more. But those guys were using the Bible, right? They were using the Bible. Were they using it with the conscience, oh, this is biblical theology? No, those, those terms weren't, these are modern terms that we're using here. Uh, so even, even though the, the discipline as a separate rubric, as it were, was not defined in those terms, I dare say it was used. Yeah. This really is kind of a, 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 a natural, natural thing. Well, I think my time is gone. Question? Well, I don't have any problem saying that. Okay. All right, I don't have any problem saying that. But I think so often in in systematic theology. How many times in systematic theology you read Burkhoff or whoever else? You know, here's the conclusion, and the, the only Bible we see for the most part is what? In parentheses, all the references that are given, right? Yeah, but I always say all, all of our confessions are systematic theology. Exactly, okay. exactly. That's, that's what my argument is. And so they're not enemies. Please understand, they are not, in, they work together. But biblical theology is going to be an emphasis now where I, I if I'm reading Burkhoff and, or whatever, oh, they just pick Burkhoff, uh, there's all these references in parentheses. Let's take them out and look at them. Look at them. What is the Bible saying here that justifies and warrants this theological conclusion? I say that's not enemies, that's, that's our friends that are working together. But let's understand the biblical basis. Let's understand the biblical basis of the confessions. And there is a biblical basis, yeah. right? It's not just man's ideas. Yeah. It comes from the Bible. It comes from the Bible. Ha have you looked at, have you ever, have, have you used uh, Raymond's systematic theology at all? You seen Raymond's? What, I, what I like about Raymond, uh, something I don't like about Raymond, but so, so what, what I, his approach, basically, he's, he's trying to incorporate biblical theology and systematic in that he doesn't just give the references in parentheses. He'll actually give you an exegesis and an exposition of, of the text that he's using. Then the, there's the two wedding together. Okay. All right, we'll come back here and uh, ne next time. Man. These classes are very long. You have to go someplace. Can I just finish up one thought? All right, finish up one thought. Uh, you guys online, you okay? If you're not, I guess I'll never know. Uh, <laughs> let let us know. All right, if you if you have to go, this will this will be recorded and you can uh, you can look at it. But I, I do want to finish this because our time is going to be at a at a premium. Uh, Voss argues. All right, have you, you've all read Voss, right? Biblical theology. Voss argues that biblical theology is historical, whereas systematic is logical. All right, that's the distinction that he makes. Historical versus logical. Paine differs, I think, from Voss in this way. Voss is seeing a line of development. He sees a line of development uh, whereas 